when the seventh seal is open, we see then at the beginning of the trumpets, there's silence for half an hour. And then there's another angel besides those seven with seven trumpets. And that other angel takes a coal off of the altar and mixes it with the prayers of the saints and hurls it to the earth. And there's lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder. And then we see the beginning of the open of the seven trumpets. We're going to talk about the first two today in the Word. Good morning and welcome back to Today in the Word. Hi, I'm Glenn Schaefer. Thank you for joining us as we walk through the book of Revelation. I trust you have been benefiting from it. Thank you for sharing it, whether you're following us on the podcast or YouTube or whichever means. The last verse in the Old Testament says that Elijah would come and the power and the Spirit would turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers before that great and dreadful day. Well, Jesus comes along in Matthew chapter 12 and he tells us John the Baptist is Elijah. He's the one that's come in the power and the spirit of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers. That means that when the kingdom of God comes into our life, there's a restoration in our life and a restoration in our families and a restoration in our homes. And he's depicting what would happen in Israel when the heart of the fathers would return to the children and the children to the fathers. That would be an example of repentance when John came preaching that the gospel, the kingdom was at hand for them to repent. He was Elijah, Jesus said, because he wanted them to see that this was a period of 40 years of opportunity for repentance before that generation would pass away and all of these judgments would come upon that generation. Even in Matthew 27, when they were crucifying Jesus, they cried out and said, let his blood be upon us and our children's children. <laughs> Fulfilling prophecy. How serious and grievous that was. And so when we come along and we see these seals and we see these uh, trumpets and later we see the bowls of wrath, and these seals that are open as we come to the seventh seal and there's silence in heaven for a half an hour. And then one of the angels goes, another angel besides the seven angels with the trumpet, goes and takes coals off of the altar and mixes it with the prayers of the saints and hurls it to the earth. The prayers of those saints, those saints who've been on the altar praying, O oh Lord, how long, O oh sovereign Lord, till you avenge our blood upon the inhabitants of the land. They're the apostles who have been martyred. They're the Christians who have lost their lives. And God says, a little bit longer. Until a few more have been killed, until the full measure of those who are to be killed, just as you have. That's amazing that God would have such order in time that the, they would fill up the measure of their sin. And because of that, great judgments would come. When we read these trumpets and these bowls of wrath, it is horrendous for us to see them. But we have to remember the mighty transgression of rejecting the, rejecting the Lord. When Jesus said that all of the righteous blood that was shed that would come up on that generation, keeping that mind, keep that in mind as we go through the trumpets. Today we're going to look into the first two trumpets and then we will move into the vials or the bowls later, but let's walk through these first two. Now, these first two, as I read the verses of Scripture, we're in Revelation chapter 8, verse 6 through 9. Listen to these, and then we'll come back and talk about them. Verse 6 says, Then the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to sound them. The first angel sounded his trumpet, and there came hell and fire, mixed with blood, and it was hurled down on the earth. A third of the earth was burned up. A third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. The second angel sounded his trumpet, and something like a huge mountain, all ablaze, was thrown into the sea. 
A third of the sea turned into blood. A third of the living creatures in the sea died, and the third of the ships were destroyed. What we see here are two of the trumpets that's sounding the alarm, that's sounding the alarm of the bowls of the wrath that are to follow. It's interesting how these plagues are so narrowly matched to the plagues that came against Egypt. Over in Exodus chapter 9, when the first plague of hail and fire mingled with blood, it resembles the judgments that not only came against Egypt, but also in Genesis chapter 19 that came against Sodom. It says a third of the land was burned up, a third of the trees and all the green grass. Now that means that it was not the end of the world. There was a portion of destruction. Here it uses the term third. Later we're going to see the term fourths being used. Now if we use the analogy that the trees represent the election of the remnant or the, the, the remnant that was by election, as we talked about in chapter 7 and verse 3, and of course we'll see that in chapter 9 verse 4, then this means that there would be those among those areas of believers that would suffer under these persecutions. What's interesting though, by the time the destruction comes, this is the beginning, this is the beginning of the wars. These first four trumpets are announcing a warning that would take place and the Christians would actually get out when the destruction comes. So they would not be destroyed, but they would suffer under these first few gatherings when the armies would come and they would have to get out but none of them lost their lives, but they would still suffer under it. Now, if you want to take that as a literal sense of trees, we find it interesting that that literally took place, and Josephus talks about that when Titus came and brought the armies around the cities, and there were, they were in their siege. They built embankments by the trees, cutting all the trees down in that area of the land. In fact, the quote says, he, talking about Titus, also at the same time gave his soldiers permission, or leave, it says, to set the suburbs on fire. That means everything around the city of Jerusalem and ordered that they should bring timber together and raise banks against the city because they were trying to get over the wall. So the trees were now cut down immediately and all the suburbs left naked. So there really was a destruction of the land when the armies came against apostate Israel. And those armies that came were Roman armies, yet they're called the Lord's armies. Now that's not unusual because God always uses the foreign nations to judge other nations and calls them his armies. You see that in Isaiah, when there is a destruction, Isaiah 13, when the Medes and the Persians are coming against Babylon, he calls the Medes and the Persians his army. He says it's the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is at hand. There's going to come great destruction. And there would be stars that would fall from heaven. And the sun would not give its light. And the moon would be dark. And he's describing in these end of the world biblical imagery of one power pushing over another power. We're seeing these same uh, terms used in the displacing of apostate Israel and the kingdom of God, the church coming forth, just like in Matthew 21, when Jesus said, I will take the kingdom from you and I'll give it to another that bears forth fruit and righteousness of it. And this is the birth pains of the transition of that that was the beginning of the wars. So not only do we see what reminds us of Jericho when the trumpets are announced and the walls come tumbling down, but we see analogy, of course, with the plagues in Egypt. So together they represent the destroying of the land. So obviously since these judgments only destroyed a portion, that means we know it's not talking about the end of the world. All of the curses of the law are now being imposed upon the people who once were the people of God, but now their house is left desolate. The four trumpets 
that's declared here that we're talking about to them today really represents the devastation that would come to Israel in their last days. And it would set up the events for the outbreak of what Josephus record as the time of the war. So Revelation, interestingly, uses this imagery of the 10 plagues. And since John is standing on the backs of the Hebrew writers, he would have easily known and understood that God used these plagues against Egypt to show his strength against apostate people like Egypt of his power and of his sovereign rule. Now, in reverse, God's using a similar imagery of judgment against his own people. So when you see the first trumpet blast, it's real similar to the plagues against Egypt. So it is in the second trumpet. It says that the trumpet blast of the second angel, and that of, it would be similar because of a great mountain that was burning that was cast into the sea. Now, seas represent nations. Mountains represent authorities and powers. So God is saying that the authority of Israel, which would be cast down, it would be a changing of power and authority, would be cast into the nations. They would be sent out to all the seas. They would be scattered abroad. That's exactly what happened, as Luke records it, as the days of vengeance, as it was described. So the cause of this calamity is that this is a burning mountain. This is now a destroying mountain. Now, we know the term mountain in the scriptures represents authority and God's kingdom. In fact, Israel was known as the holy mountain. Exodus 15 and 17 says, You will bring them and plant them on the mountain of your inheritance, the place, Lord, you made for your dwelling, the sanctuary, Lord, your hands established. Now the redeemed people are called Mount Zion. But there was a Mount Zion. It was a place that God met. It was his holy mountain. In fact, Micah 4.1 says that in the last days that the mountain of the Lord would be raised up above all the other mountains. It would be highest above the other mountains. What's it saying? That the authority of God's kingdom would be above all the other kingdoms. The mountain of the Lord would be high above all the others. So now we have this mountain that's blazing, that's being thrown down. No longer the shining place of the kingdom because it's been taken from them and given to another. A good imagery of that would be Jeremiah 51 when the destruction of the Medes was coming against Babylon and there the seas rise up against the nations again. Medes and Persians come, the foreign nations come and rise up on that mountain. That mountain, however, in Jeremiah 51 is called the destroying mountain. God says against Babylon as authority being changed, I am against you, O destroying mountain, you who destroy the whole land, the whole earth, declares the Lord. I will stretch out my hand against you and I will row you off the cliffs. In other words, I'm going to throw you in the seas and make you a burned out mountain. It's the same imagery that he's speaking against apostate Israel is this burning mountain that's thrown into the seas, just as this mountain is pushed off the cliffs. And no rock will be taken from you for a cornerstone, nor any stone for a foundation, for you will be desolate forever. In other words, there's not going to be anything left over. No remnant remains for you. Now, in reverse, the apostate Israel now is the mountain. And you'll see in the book of Revelation that apostate Israel is called Babylon. You're going to see it's called Egypt. You're going to see that it's called Sodom. Now, that's an ugly picture, but that's exactly what Jesus said in Matthew 23, that you're full of death. You're worse when you uh, proselyte someone. You make them children of hell. You're like uh, whitewashed sepulchers. There's no life in you. Your house is left desolate. He, he's called, he says, it's not my house, it's your house. And so Babylon is this destroying mountain that's punishing uh, or being thrown into the seas. 
We know the mountain was a place of God. We saw Mount Sinai. We know Mount Zion. So we get it very easily that the mountain of the Lord is God's place, God's temple, his holy mountain. But it's seen here in this imagery of being cast into the sea. You might find it interesting when you go through the Gospels now, if you read it with this in mind, if you were to read Matthew 21 through 24, you'd see Jesus regularly speaking against apostate Israel. Particular chapter 21, you can say all the way through 20 through 24, but, but uh, you can also say chapters 12 through 24, but you see it a lot in chapters 20 through 24. And you get over in chapter 21 when he tells about those vine dressers that we've re referenced, the owner that went away, and he sent his servants back to check on his vineyard, and the vine dressers beat the servants that he sent, and finally he sent his son, and they said, we're going to take the son and kill the son and get the inheritance. The Jews were saying, we're going to get the inheritance and by rejecting Christ. You can't have God by, re by rejecting the Son. The Son is God. It's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. You can't reject the Messiah, which is the Son of God. And yet they did. And that's where Jesus was speaking. And one day, passing by in that same chapter, he saw a fig tree that was not giving forth fruit, and he cursed it. <laughs> And it withered. The next day came by and it was withered. The, apostle, the disciples were asking him about that. And Jesus makes a statement. He says, truly, I say to you, this is chapter 21, verse 21 and 22. He said, truly, I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you shall not only do what I've done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be you taken up and cast in the sea, it shall happen. And all these things you ask in prayer, believing you shall receive them. Now, Jesus is not teaching his disciples to go around cursing fig trees. <laughs> uh, I, I just want us to see the bigger picture of the Bible in context. And he's not telling us to say to this rock, pile of rocks and dirt, mountain be thou removed and cast in the sea. Jesus would not want us to tempt God. He's telling us in the context of his rebuking apostate Israel that your prayers will bring about the change and the transformation. As you pray, my kingdom come, your will be done. That's how he taught us to pray, particularly that first generation, because it would be a transitioning from one authority to another. So when Jesus says that all the righteous blood that had been shed on the earth would be placed upon Jerusalem, as we already said, they said in the crucifixion, well, let his blood be upon us. Do you get the picture? This is the mighty declarations of pronouncing as a trumpet sounding a warning on his holy mountain, so to speak. A third of the sea would turn into blood. A third of the living creatures in the sea died. And a third of the ships were destroyed. Now, obviously, because of that mountain being thrown into the sea, the seas representing nations, they were affected. Commerce was affected. Living creatures in the sea were affected. There was also literal happening in the seas around Jerusalem. The cities of Joppa and Terke were two cities on the coastland, and these two got involved in some of the war times that Josephus records. If you want to talk about literal fulfillment, you can literally be seen in light of this because the Jewish rebels tried to escape the city of Jerusalem when it was under siege and got in their ships and went out. And consequently, the ships were destroyed, some by the wind, some by the rocks, and then some by the armies that were coming against them or the naval forces that were coming against them. And their ships were totally destroyed. And it was said that they were dashed to pieces in so much that the sea was bloody from the dead bodies. In fact, Josephus writes this, One might then see the lake all bloody, full of dead bodies. Not one of them escaped. And a terrible stink and a very sad sight there was on the following days over the country. For as far as the shores, they were full of shipwrecks and dead bodies and all swelled. That's a literal picture of when this event is taking place. Now, I believe the reference there is more to the mountain being cast into the nations, into the seas, and those seas or those nations being affected, and these trumpets are bringing those warnings. 
That's just the first two trumpets. Join us next time when we address trumpet three and trumpet four today in the Word.